So please join me in welcoming Scott McNeely, and thank you all again for being here today. I'm grateful to have a chance to talk to you. Thanks, Senator Bennett. Uh, very nice introduction. Really appreciate that, and it's uh, great to be here in sunny, warm Colorado. Holy mackerel. You ought to get combat pay here. It's not even November. Uh, anyhow, there's lots I could talk about here today, uh, and uh, give me a microphone, and I'm, I'm ready to rant. But, uh, you know, I could talk about education uh, along with the senator. It's obviously something that I truly care about, but that's not the topic here. I could talk about building companies. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. You just haven't heard about the ones that didn't work. Uh, so I know both sides of that coin. Um, I could talk about tech trends. Everybody wants to know where, where the future is going. Uh, you know, I, a long time ago, somebody said the network is the computer. We blew it. We should have just called it cloud. We would have been way ahead of everybody. But uh, this week is all about the CTA and all about Colorado, so I'll try to, try to stick with that and, uh, and uh, stay focused on that. But uh, before we get into it, that, I want to not make this just a lecture, uh, a, a one-to-many broadcast, but rather a conversation. And if you all go to the Demo Gala app that's uh, on your phone, hopefully, or you, uh, you can go to the website or whatever, you'll have a chance to actually participate in the topics of conversation that I want to talk about. Uh, and that's what weigh-in's all about, is trying to uh, spark the conversation. The Internet's not really great at one-to-many conversations. It's great at one-to-many broadcasts with like YouTube and Twitter and those kinds of environments. Facebook's kind of a many-to-many, -many, I don't know what it is. I still, I still struggle with that. Uh, but uh, I have an account. I don't know what to do with it. My relationship status is I went from open systems to closed systems a long time ago, so I'm kind of <laughs> off the market. So um, I'm not quite sure what to do with that one. But this, uh, this environment allows you to go. If you just go to the weigh-in button, you'll see the little weigh-in button right there. Uh, you can click and follow on and uh, vote, post comments, uh, agree or disagree with other people's comments, that sort of thing. So check it out. Um, and by the way, after. Uh, is also a good time. <clears throat> After you've had a chance to hear some of the thoughts that I'm going to offer, you can all weigh in. And this will give the CTA uh, some real data from all of you about what you think Colorado needs to do <clears throat> to build the Silicon Mountain. One of the guys made a comment already this morning that he didn't understand Silicon did not have an E on the end of it. He couldn't quite figure that one out. But um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, that was... It just came to me just now. Um, <clears throat> before, we, um, <clears throat> before we get into this, I thought I'd add a little humor. I don't have a marketing department, so you'll have to laugh, but I thought I'd do a big uh, top ten list here um, on uh, the top ten reasons it's better to do a startup in Colorado than California. So, uh, so here you go, the uh, top ten reasons why. And we didn't move way in. We just started way in here. And, uh, probably this isn't one of the top ten, but California is ranked 50th. So before you feel too good about yourself, it wasn't like I was running to Colorado. I didn't, I didn't need to go do the train ride at the airport, at DOA, I mean DIA airport. <laughs> Could you put it out a little further? Um, <clears throat> never mind, I digress. But <clears throat> I really was running from... California, which is the 50th of 50 states in terms of business attractiveness. It is the most hostile place to go do a startup. And if you can't beat California, you've got to look introspectively and say we've got to do some things differently because you really do have some very amazing advantages. So the top 10 reasons why to start here in Colorado, Rocky Mountain Powder versus Tahoe Bunny Slopes. Number nine, a 4.63% flat income tax rate here in Colorado. And we are about to vote in California to raise the, high, the, the top rate of income tax to 13.5% in California. Go figure. And it's neck and neck. Neck and neck. Number eight, Colorado is a safer distance from Sacramento, Pelosi, and Boxer. 
Can I say that after my introduction there? Um, number seven, one and a half million dollars buys a dump in California, a ranch in Colorado. It's true, if you go there, you'll find that out. Uh, number six, in Colorado, the water is from Colorado. In California, the water is from Colorado. <laughs> Number five, the uh, red eye to New York City is half as bad. I've done that one recently. Uh, in Colorado, I can hit a golf ball 300 plus yards. <laughs> I like that one. Number three, Lodo, Colorado has better views than Mountain View, California. I know that because I live there. Uh, number two, California is a swingers state. Colorado is a swing state. And the number one reason to start, uh, to do a new startup in Colorado is that Weigh In is located in downtown Denver. Thank you very much. So now I'd sort of like to get into the meat of uh, the conversation here. And uh, again, you can follow along. But what, what do we need? Uh, and, and you all have a chance to, you can add your own answer. Uh, you don't have to click on the answers that are uh, on the application. So if you have a better idea than somebody else has offered, put that and it'll rise to the top uh, and you can make whatever comments you want. But, you know, you need, you need the right, you got plenty of people here. That's not the issue. You need the right kind of people. You need entrepreneurs. Uh, and, you know, I worked, I, I was on the board at uh, GE when Jack Welch was there and he was uh, of the belief that you can't really create leaders, and I think entrepreneurs are the same sort of folk. Uh, you can only identify them. Uh, it's, it's kind of in the gene pool, and you, know, you have to go identify the folks who are classic leaders. I mean, who'd have thunk that uh, Steve Jobs would be a leader if you'd met him early on, watched him drop out of school? It, 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 you can't, he didn't create Steve, nobody created, no, he had no mentor. He didn't go to school to learn to be a leader. He just flat out was one of the most creative genius leaders. And he certainly didn't learn at any MBA school from any HR director how to manage. For any of you who've ever worked for him or read about his management style, it was, it was not fun. But I'll tell you what he had, he had managerial courage. And that's what you need to find. You need to identify folks who have managerial courage. Now, I always say, uh, and that gets to my point about having a controversial strategy. If you don't have a controversial strategy, you have no chance. Because if everybody thinks what you're doing is the right thing to do, everybody will do it. If everybody's doing it, you don't have any differentiation. If you don't have any differentiation, you have no pricing power. If you have no pricing power, you're not going to make money. If you don't make money, you got no business. Right? So the problem is you have to be the bigger the bigger the opportunity, the more controversial you have to be. The real key is you have to be correct. Now that one I can't help you with, because if you're controversial and wrong, you look pretty stupid. So you've got to be controversial and correct, but you've got to have people who have that managerial courage and are, are ready to go for it. The second piece of it is only the most secure can do nothing. So the real problem with really good leaders is they're very insecure. Uh, and, and I sort of feel that way. I, I can't go to the beach and hang out. After a half hour, I jump up going, who's winning? What's the score? Did I make a difference? And after a half hour on the beach, it's pretty clear I haven't done any of those things and, and I gotta move on. So you need somebody who's very insecure. The problem with insecurity is you gotta make sure they, they uh, cover it with a huge dose of integrity and character and strength of character. Because you've all seen, you know, the, the phrase power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely. And as you get to be a leader with power, you can get, um, you've got to have the integrity to stay on the right side of the force. Right? You can't slip over to the dark side and, and so integrity becomes very important. I also think being a leader you need to have, you need to be a little bit corny. So you've got to be this courageous person with high integrity and a little bit corny. Like, you have to have a cause. You have to have a higher order bit because people don't work just for money. They work for a psychic income. 
and people will align and go that extra yard if you have. A, and, and I didn't learn this at Sun until uh, a little later in my career, but we sort of had a cause I just didn't realize. And we were trying to bridge the digital divide while doing no harm to the planet. And I said, why don't we just articulate that as the corporate cause? Mission strategies, tactics, all the rest of it are important. But for, for leaders, you need to also have a cause, something that's a higher order bit. And you will find that humans will work really hard for you when they have that higher order bit, that, that higher order cause. So you need to be a little bit corny as a leader. Uh, it will feel a little corny sometimes, but if you're sincere about it and come up with a cause, you'll get an extra 20% out of your folks than if uh, you just try to uh, use stock and, and, uh, and uh, cash compensation to motivate them. And the last piece of it is, if you think about it, when you work, especially in a startup, you work more hours at that, you do more hours at work than you do any other activity, including sleep, spending time with your family, any of your hobbies. It is the dominant number of hours during any week that you spend. So I always told my folks that if you're not having fun, you're not going to succeed. Because if you're not having fun at work, you're not having fun at life. And that work should be fun. So we always had a phrase, kick butt and have fun. And uh, I always told my employees, if you're not having fun, um, Go sit down and talk to your boss. Tell them the five reasons you're not having fun and the five solutions to that. Because having fun is an order. You must, you must have fun. It was a requirement uh, at our company. And I think that makes a, uh, a, 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 big a big change. So anyhow, I think finding and identifying the right leaders is really key for this geography. And uh, there's no single organization that's doing that. but. Uh, you know, one thing that can help is education. And, and I'm, I'm all for, you know, job training and all the rest of it. I, I, we could have a long debate about whether education belongs in the public or private sector. I'm a raging libertarian, and I believe the government prosecutes just about everything they do ineffectively, inefficiently, corruptly, uh, and a whole bunch of other non... But I'm not an anarchist. So I think we ought to have a Defense Department and all the rest of it. But I just think education is far too critical to leave in the hands of the government. And I think anything you can do to privatize that, you know. But the question here is, is college necessary? And I would, you know, I heard the statistic that Governor Bennett just, or Senator Bennett had just mentioned. Um, I have a son who just got into Stanford. And he'll go there next year. I said, where, people ask him, where are you going, Maverick? He says, oh, I'm going to Stanford to play golf. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> that's not why you're going to Stanford. Actually, it is. Um, and that's the unfortunate part. Um, I had a very, my wife and I had a very long and serious, dead serious conversation. This may sound wacko. Uh, but he's a, he's a I'm, I'm biased, he's a pretty uh, impressive kid. He knows more about everything than I know. Uh, I have a little more wisdom than he has. Uh, he's very, a huge sense of purpose and seriousness of intent and uh, very mature. I said, listen, Maverick, you can save me a ton of money because you're only getting a very partial scholarship there. Stanford knows who I am. Um, I said, you could save me a lot of money by going to Denver and working for Way in for the next four years. He says, I want to play golf. I said, I will buy you a club membership somewhere, and I will fly you to any golf tournament you want, first class. You just go work. Not only will you get paid, but I won't have to pay out. And after four years, and any night classes you need to take online, I guarantee you, you will be 10 years ahead of all of your buddies who are at school, drinking beer, uh, you know, screwing around, you know, I won't tell you all the bad things that happen at college, but you've been there and you've done that. So um, I said, we will absolutely support you if you go do that. And who knows, in four years you could be CEO of Weigh-In. And imagine how different. And, and look at Zuckerberg, Gates, Balmer. I mean, Gates and Balmer, they were contemporaries of mine and Jobs, all the rest. They all dropped out. I finished Stanford under, uh, uh, Graduate School, Harvard undergrad. And look at me now. I'm giving speeches at the CTO. These guys are running, you know, or, you know, Steve's got a legacy that, you know, will maybe never be surpassed. I chased them my entire career because they all got head starts. 
So I seriously think we need to evaluate where education ought to happen and whether it's really adding value. And uh, I, I seriously challenge you to think about why do we fund college loans for non-STEM, I'm going to be a little controversial, why non-STEM degrees? That's crazy. You know what? I, I don't know what to do when a classics major comes to my office and says I want a job. Think about it. And, and, and we've got to be a little bit more uh, d discriminatory in terms of what we allow federal or state or local money to be spent on. It doesn't mean well, I want to eliminate them. If you want to go do it, have at it. But what do we support and what do we want to encourage? So I, I think uh, another message I would give you is, uh, you know, youth matters. And the ages of 18 to 22 are some of the most creative and powerful in just about any endeavor, if you look. Uh, it's a shame to waste that on campus, that energy, that creativeness, that uh, absolute uh, ignorance is bliss kind of uh, attitude that I think is incredibly valuable in starting companies. And uh, so I think the education system has to figure out how not to, uh, to stifle all that. I will also tell you that uh, college can, especially STEM, can be very, very valuable. Uh, a uh, survey just came out recently, in fact, I, I, I found it on the web yesterday, uh, that if companies founded by Stanford graduates formed an independent nation, it would be the 10th largest economy in the world, according to a study done by, uh, again, it's self-serving by Stanford folks, but uh, they, they have the Stanford University graduates have created an estimated 5.4 million jobs and generated revenues of $2.7 trillion dollars. Uh, based on a 2011 alumni survey. Uh, Sun, uh, Sun would have been one of those. Sun stood for Stanford University Network, was a spin out out of, out of Stanford. And I think we created 235,000 jobs before we were bought by Oracle. So, uh, you know, there is a, there is a really uh, important component, and that is to have a strong STEM university there attracting and bringing people there. And the, the study says that uh, the bulk of the entrepreneurs started companies within 20 miles of Stanford after graduating or after dropping out, as was the case of Andy Bechtelsheim and Bill Joy, who both dropped out, two of our co-founders, to go start Sun. So, you know, we were all brought up to believe the degree matters. No, youth matters. And uh, I think that's an important uh, distribution. So how do we make Colorado the best? Um, you know, I don't have any magic answers for you. Uh, and, and I think this is one that it's important for all of you to uh, give uh, the governor, the senators, uh, and uh, the CT, CTA uh, your input on. Uh, I think less regulations, less taxes, uh, a, a STEM university environment, keeping the cost of living low, those are all um, important and natural. I certainly believe an NHL team is important. Oh, check, you got that. Go Sharks. Um, but uh, <laughs> what happened to the season? Anyhow, I digress again. Um, the, um, I will give you a policy suggestion. You're competing with 50 other states for the best and the brightest globally. And here's a and I haven't thought through all of this, but I would, I would try and figure out how to implement something like this if I were running the state. All new graduates, all new STEM graduates, H-1B visa uh, immigrants, and engineers who are practicing engineers in the technologies you want to go after. I'm not talking managers, just the practicing frontline engineers actually creating something should, when they move to Colorado, uh, or graduate from school should get a five-year income tax-free visa in Colorado. So kids who go to California can pay 13.5%. They can come here and pay nothing for the first five years they're here. The first five years are key because then they're going to find a mate and get married and then they're not going to move, kind of like I'm stuck in Colorado, uh, California right now. Anyhow, uh, the, the second piece of it is 
How about zero capital gains for equity invested in the first five years of a startup? If you want to, this is not going to change the budget deficit at all here. In fact, I, I'm, I'm not into stimulus programs. I'm into uh, private sector stimulus. This would stimulate a whole host of new companies and hopefully would, um, would uh, I think, drive what you want to do, and that's get a home run here in Colorado. Because I'll tell you what, uh, Zynga and uh, Twitter and some of these others, uh, certainly Facebook, have supported the housing market in the Bay Area. It just brings an enormous amount of money from around the world to this geography. And you need to hit a home run. So uh, there, I, I think you need to get the people to want to come here and do their startups. Uh, how, how, do you, uh, how do you get the next Twitter going here? Well, you use government purchasing power. I think the government should be trying to buy local. I think that's important. I think uh, the collaboration is very important. Uh, there's an interesting collaboration, and, and a couple of states ought to gang up together. Uh, that happened a long time ago when uh, Governor Romer uh, and Governor Levitt uh, came to me and said, Let, w would you help us with education? And I, um, off, I actually provided some uh, angel funding for the Western Governors University. I was the original uh, uh, angel investor in that online, I'm kind of into the online education thing uh, with Kariki and and the Western Governors University has turned out to be a massive success. And uh, finding some ways to drive that kind of uh, multi-state uh, collaboration, I think, could be uh, very important. I think the Colorado uh, community here has to buy from each other. I think weigh-in should be collaborating with every one of the little startups here and integrating and working together, and everybody should be using weigh-in and vice versa. It's just if you, if you help each other out, you'll get the networking uh, going. And, and I think this, this event is a very, very powerful uh, opportunity to, to create uh, those winners. And we need to cheer each other on and help each other out enormously. Uh, I, I will tell you we have the, the biggest problem here is finding enough talented STEM folks, technology. For, at, the, uh, at the conference, there were plenty of people who were sales folks. There weren't a plenty, plenty of technologists looking for jobs here. Too many liberal arts sales reps and not enough uh, scientifically backed engineers. And that's a real issue uh, in, in this country, not just here in, in uh, Colorado. What can the city of Denver do? I think the, since uh, unfortunately I can't twinkle my nose a la bewitched and make education private and send in, therefore competitive and successful. We're stuck with the government running uh, the bulk of our education system, but it's got to push hard on the STEM focus. We've got to make it cool to learn science, technology, programming. Uh, I tell my two boys, learn, or my four boys, I say you need to learn two things. Java and Mandarin. So, uh, you know, everybody needs to think about that. Uh, the senator mentioned Kariki.org. I'm biased, but, you know, we spend 8 to $15 billion a year on curriculum every year annually, once a year. What's up with that? My son drags, they drag rolling suitcases to school because they have $130 third grade math textbooks in there when nothing's changed since Newton got hit on the head with an apple. And your school districts are all buying these gratuitously revised $130 textbooks where 10 plus 10 was, is, and will be 20 forever. It's ridiculous. Imagine, so I went to, I went, and this is a nonpartisan comment about why we should eliminate the Department of Education at the, at the national level. I went to see Secretary Spellings under Bush and I went to see Arnie Duncan under Obama. And I said, listen, I've spent $2 billion plus in R&D. Son was a top 40 R&D spender worldwide, all geographies, all um, technologies, all industries, whatever, aerospace, pharmaceutical, whatever. 
And we did pretty darn, we were one of the most effective R&D companies. I think if you gave me $200 million over the next five years that I would spend it wisely in our .org. And after five years, I will give you a f completely free, open source, online, multimedia, web-enabled, real-time scored, self-paced, K through 12 curriculum that your citizens, your students, every parent would, because it's real-time scored, it'd be like a video game for all of the kids, you would not be able to get the, the biggest problem we'd have is sleep deprivation because the kids, you'd say to them, step away from the computer every night. Go right to bed now. The kids would go absolutely, there, there's no question in my mind. And I went to both of them and I said, can you just like call all the departments of education from around the world, the ministers of education, and prorate based on GDP and give me $30 million a year and I'll create you a K through 12 education environment that is all open source and free. And both of them looked at me and said, we got no money. Quote, not, I mean, and, and my interpretation of that was, we're giving it all away to the states to buy votes. Now, think about the trillions of dollars spent globally, and we can't find $200 million over the next five years. But anyhow, I think uh, there's an enormous opportunity uh, uh, to, to leverage free and open source, they call it open education resources, to take a huge number out and to light up the kids' eyes. Have you ever seen them read a textbook and jump up and go, yes! They don't do that. But you watch them do a typing skills uh, application on a computer, and they got a huge smile. And they're, it's, it's like playing Pac-Man, only they're learning something. Um, I would facilitate private education wherever you can. I'm a big believer in parents having a choice for their kids. Uh, I think it's tragic that we don't give them that choice. And I would ask business leaders locally here to mentor the kids and mentor. There needs to be uh, education business partnership. I, I don't appreciate the business world being demonized like it is. I, I think that's the wrong message to send to kids. They aren't cheaters. They aren't uh, crooks. Uh, and in fact, the system clobbers the crooks in the private sector very effectively. It doesn't clobber the cro crooks in the public sector uh, effectively at all. So uh, anyhow, that's a little uh, uh, paid political uh, conversation there. Building community is, um, I think, important. We did that at Sun by opening our interfaces, open sourcing our software, running lots of conferences. Java One was the largest developer conference uh, in the world at its, uh, when, uh, when Sun was around. Uh, and and I, I believe these kinds of events have to happen. You've got to build the physical networking, the electronic networking. That's why we're doing weigh-in. As a, as a CEO, there weren't, a uh, recovering CEO, I looked around and I said, you know, there just weren't any tools that really targeted allowing an executive to have a one-to-many conversation and engagement and build community with all of the constituencies that you had, employees, uh, suppliers, resellers, shareholders, uh, all the rest of it, uh, developers. So that's a, a, an important uh, focus. Uh, Colorado, I think, has a huge opportunity. Uh, it's ranked, uh, as of 2011, was ranked ninth overall by the Small Business and Entrepreneurial Council in Washington, D.C. I think you all need a cause, you all need a mission, and that is you ought to be number one. And, and I think as a group, you ought to get together with the uh, state and local uh, government agencies, and you ought to work together in the CTA. Ought, you ought to all help the CTA become the number one. I think you're within shouting distance, and I think you have all of the pieces there to go make that happen. And uh, I, would, I would argue that's probably a pretty good uh, mission for all of you. Uh, to go forward. You have, you have a, lot of, a lot of opportunity here. You have a great place to live. There's not a lot of air here, but uh, <laughs> the, my speech would have been better, except I think it was the altitude. Um, <laughs> couldn't, have, couldn't resist that one. Um, so anyhow, I guess my, my call to action for all of you would be, 
go to weigh in, go to the, the app and participate and let the CTA know your thoughts. Uh, I think you heard the, uh, key, you might have heard the keynote speaker last night uh, explain that it's not going to be 30 people who have the great ideas. It's going to be the wisdom of the crowds here. Uh, so, so participate. I'll certainly be uh, checking in and adding my, uh, my two cents from uh, California. I think all of you in this room ought to take, take responsibility to go mentor and coach folks. Take a little time out and find the kids, uh, find the, the rookies, uh, find the, those who are struggling and those who are doing well, and mentor and coach them. Another message to you all, especially the young folks before you get married and have kids and have responsibilities, take a chance. Use somebody else's money, but take a chance. And I think the real challenge here for you all is that you need a stronger and bigger venture community. Because it, it's, it's a game of numbers. And most of the startups I've done haven't succeeded. But the net present value of those investments turn out to be pretty good. You just need numbers. And I don't think there's a strong enough venture community here. Yet there's an enormous amount of wealth. And why should, why, I'm just picking up a name randomly, but why should a Phil Anschutz have to go somewhere else to invest his money? Why can't he invest it here locally? Uh, and uh, uh, some of you ought to think about getting into the venture business and, uh, and getting it rolling. It can be quite profitable. The problem with the venture capitalists in California is most of them have a little quiet, unspoken rule, which is I'm not going to invest in anything more than 20 miles from my house. And uh, that makes it very, very hard. And, and money is what makes it uh, go around. Buy local. I mentioned that. Network like crazy. And, uh, and uh, good luck. My point uh, about starting a company, if you use somebody else's money, is you won't miss a meal. Uh, it, it won't uh, change your lifestyle, but uh, it to, the, to the negative, and uh, it, uh, it really isn't risky. I'll tell you what's risky, running a big, successful company. Zuckerberg is running a very risky operation now. He wasn't running a risky operation when he was at Harvard. And uh, everybody thinks about risk-taking entrepreneurs. No, all these kids you see coming up here, they're not taking any risk, unless they're using their own money. But uh, I guess I'm using a little money at weigh-in, so I'm taking a little bit of a risk there. But uh, I think I can afford that at this point. But uh, when we started Sun, we used other people's money. And it was not risky because I was young. I didn't have a family. I was single. And I could go 90 hours a week. We need to find the kids who want to go do this. And we need to, to give them some money. One last thing I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with as a, as a potential idea to think about. And, and I, I'm all for charity. And I think it's a good thing. And I'm certainly spending a lot of money at curriculum.org uh, out of our own uh, foundation, my own personal foundation. But imagine that Gates and Buffett took their tens of billions of dollars. And instead of giving it all to charities, say they took 80% of it and divided it up into $5 million chunks. And then they gave that out to companies that wanted to start, kids who wanted to start up out of business school. And then they created a whole series of uh, review boards with people like me on it that would review, say, Stanford grads who came with a business plan and brought some engineers and, and some marketeers and stuff and said, here's our business plan. We'd like $5 million to go start it. And imagine we did that all around the country, out of every business school. Every graduate from every business school could come and present to a board. And if they got an acceptable grade on their business plan got five million dollars for half their company. Imagine that as a stimulus versus eight hundred billion dollars of uh, government pork going to public sector union projects or whatever. Imagine the difference. Imagine. Don't you think if you took thirty billion dollars divided by five, that number of startups, of young kids coming out of school. How many more kids would want to go to business school? How many engineers would go hang out with MBAs on campus? And how many of them would spend two years coming up with the greatest business plan? And how many of those do you think would go public and turn the Gates Buffett Foundation into a far larger organization? And it would require no government help whatsoever. Just another interesting idea before you think it's all great that this wealth should be given to the government in taxes as opposed to given to people 
to go reinvest in the private sector economy. So anyhow, food for thought. Hopefully it was uh, provocative in, in some ways, uh, uh, if, if, uh, if not totally wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyhow, those are some of the perspectives I have for you all to think about here as, as you do a really great and wonderful thing, and that's uh, drive uh, the, the private economy, the, uh, the private uh, sector, which is what creates jobs, training, taxes, self-esteem, and most importantly, goods and services that make the quality of life everybody, uh, for everybody everywhere much better. So keep up the good battle. Thanks for all your hard work, and uh, best of luck to you. Thank you.